Otto Schill. I'm a shareholder at the Jackson White Law Firm, and I practice in, in uh, conglomerative areas that focus on business employers and, and employer regulation. So I practice in several highly regulated areas, regulated areas, tax, employment, business organizations, and disputes that go along with, with those issues. So tell me about you guys. Tell me about this class. What is this class? What are you learning here? Say it louder. Okay. What else? What do you expect to get out of this class? Okay. What else? This is the part where you talk a lot. Because you get really bored if I do all the talking, right? What do you expect to get out of the class? General knowledge of opening and operating and small business. Okay. What about you? Okay, taxes and accounting. What other classes are you taking that complement this? Okay. What about you? What are you taking? What do you want to do with it? Talk to God. Talk. Okay. So why why is this class important to you? Okay. How many do you expect? When you get out of school, where get out, whatever school get out of school means to you, how many of you expect to go to work for a large company? Say more than 100 employees. How many of you expect to oh, go to work for somebody who's got 20 employees, 20 to 50? Okay. How many of you expect to open your own business? Okay. So we're focused more on small business and or, or entrepreneurial endeavors. What? It, who raised your hand? What do you want to do? Tell us your, your idea. Me? Yeah. Um, I've got a, a thousand ideas. My my biggest dream is to own a, a game store where people come and rent time to play games. Okay. What about you? What do you want to do? Okay. Wow, two of you in one class. That's pretty good. There's more. There's more. Are there really? <laughs> Part of the okay. So that's, that's okay. So let's talk about that. How does the mortuary business work? What do you know about that? Let's take that one. Both are services that you render to families, but it's also partly merchandising because you have equipment that you sell to the family, and it's kind of a necessity because there's laws on how and where to be buried or cremated. Okay. Uh, do you do it with other people or do you do it alone? It's a lot easier with multiple people. Okay. What people do you... Um, like Louder. Embalming, like and also so technical folks who know how to do that. And so I'm not very good at talking to you, but I would hire somebody else to like, talk to you. Okay. Okay. You can have partners. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, that's true. What else? You gonna have partners? You can do it by yourselves? What do you plan? We talked about that. You gonna go into business with him? I don't know. What are you What are you doing? <laughs> you need somebody to do hair and makeup. <laughs> <laughs> okay. She wants to do hair and makeup, guys. Um, are anybody going to go into business with anybody else? Okay. How many of you think you'll have a partner before your career is over? Okay. So, in the context of all that, tell me what you want to talk about today. What are you interested in? I'm just going to make a list on the board, and then we'll organize it and figure it out and talk about it. We're doing the class the other day, you know, like one of the problems is personnel. So, like, how would you deal with Yeah, you can't shoot them. <laughs> what else? What are, what, what are you interested in? Well, as a group, we have some questions to be important. And then uh, we say that we are interested to where does person who is starting a small business uh, go to obtain necessary funds? 
go to what? I didn't hear. Necessary forms, like to start. Okay. How to how to start one? Okay. Which forms that we need and so on. Also, we have the how to retain uh, the name of the corporation, the laws that you know that we can learn. What else? Yep. I want to know the costs involved with, like, how much does it cost to have a lawyer to get my back? Lots. <laughs> I figured that. Now the answer is it depends. What else? I'm sorry, we'll get you both. You first. Contributions or money, money in or money out? Yeah, like money in to start up, like a capital. Okay. Yeah. Hang on. Go ahead. Your okay. question. Can I, in Arizona license, chiropractor be hired to practice chiropractic by business, which is is not chiro license? Oops, I don't know. But we'll talk about that. Any other things you've been thinking about that you want to make sure get on the list? Yeah. Before somebody sues you. I, I told in the class that the, 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 the best attorney, you know, protect, protect you when you get into court, but the really great attorney to keep you out of court. Yeah, with with the modification that nothing can protect you from stupid people who want to sue you just because they want to. Right? I mean, that's. But that's the right point. Anything? Okay, so let's. Um, Now I got to organize this into a presentation, right? On the fly. Let Let's do this. Let's talk about um, formation entities, partners, um, details of how to how to do it. Now you can clearly see why I'm not a teacher for a living because no one can read what I write, right? Um, let, let's talk about operations. And let's talk about um, agreements. And then let's talk about regulations. I think that that'll pretty much cover and then we'll pick up whatever well, whatever we miss and let, let you ask questions. So, and I'm not going to write with that thing the whole time. Um, how do we start? And your question, your question was what, there, there's no magic there down if you want, but it's just like to keep us organized. You, I think your question was what forms do you use? It to conclude that you can make your mortuary business by just filling in a bunch of check boxes. You, you can do it, and if you're the only one involved, and if you're doing all the service, that probably works okay. As you get more complexity, more regulation, as you get more partners, as employees. The more people you reach out to, the more interactions with government you have, the less likely it is that you'll be successful just by taking care of forms. Your tax form, for example, how do you fill out an income tax form every year, form 1040. Okay? Those of you who don't have a problem, but we can talk about afterwards. Um, 
for filling the that's the way you report your financial life to the government and on the basis of that report they determine a tax liability that you owe and just because there's a box to put a number in doesn't mean there's only one way to determine what number goes in there or what you report it doesn't tell you what subsidiary schedules to put on or what uh, what facts to disclose so when we talk about about forms there are a lot of forms available. You can go to the library, you can go online, you can go to the, to the Maricopa County Law Library and you can get forms. It's important to know what to do with those. So one, one question you asked is, when do you need a lawyer? It's expensive. I cost $300 an hour. So you don't want to waste time with me, but you would rather know ahead of time, for example, what, what an agreement with your partner should say before you get a partner because by the time you get a partner and you've formed a relationship and you have obligations to one another legally, it may be harder to get the agreement done. So we'll talk a little bit about some of those. So the, the first, and you've probably, have you gone over basic business entities, types of entities? So we don't need to, we don't need to go through that but in detail, but each, each of the types of entities you've studied has a different set of consequences, okay? So you've talked about limited liability companies. Okay, people like those. The reason they like them is there is less state regulation, okay? If I form a limited liability company, it's the same as forming a corporation from a form standpoint. The documents I have to turn in are similar, but I don't have to file an annual report and pay an annual fee to the Corporation Commission for that. Okay. No matter which entity you form, it's important to know that everybody else in the world will only treat it as important as you treat it. Okay. So if you don't take care of writing down important corporate decisions in an, in a, an official way, minutes for a corporation or whatever you want to call them, if you don't keep separate bank accounts. If, if you open a business and you use your personal bank account for your business bank account and then you hire, let's say you hire somebody to be a delivery person, okay? And you send them out in a car and they're delivering something and they run over somebody's kid and kill them. Now, same what? Same analogy, she is classic. Yeah. Yeah, same. So, so if you haven't been formal about the way you treat your company, whichever type of entity you choose, you can probably expect that if I'm the lawyer suing you, I'm going to try to figure that out and I'm not going to treat your entity with the same formality. In fact, because I know that your company doesn't have any money, my goal is going to be to ignore your entity and go to you because you've got the money, right? So if I'm, if I'm a lawyer suing somebody, I am looking for where the money is and getting rid of entities sometimes is the path to that. So when, when wh whatever type of entity you pick, it's important to figure out what formal processes it ought to have and then observe them. If you're going to make important decisions, I would always keep minutes. If, you know, if you're going to have a limited liability company, make sure your filings are right. Make sure they're, that you've published the, the notice in the paper after you form it. Make sure that, that if somebody tries to use your name, you stop them, you send them a letter, you make them quit. Maybe you have to hire a lawyer to do it. Make sure you protect that entity because if you pay attention to it, so will everybody else have to pay attention to it and a judge will make them pay attention to it. Okay. Um, another difference between entities is the level of formality. So if you have a corporation and you issue stock in the corporation, then you've set in stone the percentages that, ever, that, that the owners of that stock have. So if you're going to have another person involved and they have 50% of the stock and you have 50% of the stock, what does each of you own? 50%. What if you started the business and he was helping you and so you decided because he was working hard to give him 50% of the stock and then 
he decides to quit helping you. What does he own? He owns 50% of the stock. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, it's important to know people have opinions and attitudes, right? So when, when they're working in a business and there's, there's ownership involved, you know, you'd think they own IBM by the way they act about it, you know, when the reality is in most small businesses, if you don't go to work every day or I don't go to work every day, there is no money, right? <clears throat> but, but more than one dispute has come up because people didn't pay attention to who owns what and, and once somebody owns it, you can't take it away. So when you're forming an entity, if it's a corporation and you're passing out stock, one, you might want to do that in exchange for money, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Two, you want to make sure that you're, you're comfortable with who you're in business with and what they own. And then we'll talk about agreements how, about how to, how to deal with that. If you have a limited liability company, how, how many of you have heard that a limited liability company is more flexible than a corporation? Anybody heard that? Okay. That, that's a common theme and it is somewhat more flexible in that a limited liability company often is treated as a partnership for federal tax purposes. When you treat it as a partnership, your percentage, un unless you take a different step, your percentage floats with how much money you put in and how much money you take out. Right? So if I contribute $100 and you contribute $100, we're each 50%, right? But if then I take a distribution of 50, we're not 50% anymore, right? Okay? So, so a, a limited liability company that is treated as a partnership, your interest can float with how much money goes in and out and who puts it in and, and how that works. That results in a whole bunch of different type of planning. Sometimes money goes in as loans, sometimes it goes in with priority distribution so it can only be unequal for a limited period of time and then we'll, then, you know, then we'll make that get paid off fast so we can go back to being 50-50 or 40-60 or whatever we really want to be. Now, can you define the percentage? Sure, you can define the percentage, but there's a cost for everything, right? So if, if we're being taxed as a partnership, that means the Internal Revenue Service in the end will expect us to share profits and losses even in liquidation based on the relative amounts that we've contributed to the business. So we can lock down our percentage in terms of profit sharing and we'll only each get a certain amount of money but if we have to liquidate the business and share losses and liabilities and all those things, there could be tax consequences at the end and somebody could have income charged to them because they'd taken out more, for example, than, than they had put in. So the type of entity that you choose, th th those are just kind of two, uh, contrasting examples of the difference between how a partnership might work and a corporation might work. Once you issue stock in a corporation, the percentage is locked, the consequences are locked, capital in and out doesn't matter except as between you, the stock is the stock. Not necessarily so with a limited liability company. Then, how many of you heard of, have heard of S corporations? Okay, so some smart people someplace decided that they wanted from a tax perspective to have the same uh, tax consequences that a partnership had but they wanted a corporation. They wanted that because when all of this started, when, when S corporations came into the Internal Revenue Code, corporations had a lot of liability protection. Limited liability companies hadn't been thought of and there were no statutes in the state uh, codes to allow you to form a limited liability company so your choice was partnership or corporation. Well, and so the S corporation statutes in the Internal Revenue Code are de de designed to allow you to form a corporation, fix all the percentages, but then have the income tax consequences pass through to the owners of the business rather than being taxed at a corporate level. There are a whole bunch of tax games that we can play with, with that that we don't, we don't need to go into today. 
Then about 1982 to 85, com or, uh, states started enacting statutes to say there's a new type of entity, limited liability companies. Well, let me back up. The reason for corporations, the reason people like them is the statutes of the states that sponsor those, those corporations put in the statutes that the owners of the, of the stock will be protected from the liabilities of the corporation. Okay, So if you hire somebody in your XYZ corporation, somebody runs over somebody, one of your employees runs over somebody's kid and you've protected the formalities, you didn't do it. And you didn't hire the person, your corporation did. So the statute says you can't be responsible for, for that problem. Okay, um, So the reason limited liability statutes were enacted was to give that same kind of liability protection for partnership style arrangements. And so now what you get is people form limited liability companies because they're simpler. Less, there's less reporting to the state. They have agreements that are like partnership agreements called operating agreements and they make an S corporation election with respect to them so that everything passes through and, and just like an S corporation would. So now we've got this mix of a lot of different type of entities with different type of tax elections. What questions do you have about that? Is that too jumbled or did it make sense? Mm -hmm. Like say you have an LLC corporation, but then you start messing around and you know divvying up finances like a partnership or you know recording your business conduct like another form of entity. Wouldn't a lawyer be able to see that and be like, well, they're not actually operating as an LLC; they're actually operating as a partnership. Yeah, absolutely. And be able to change your entity, and then through that change. You know, destroy the whole corporate fail. Could. How you go about doing that, but how you go about protecting, you know, you want to be LLC, but, you know, you want to, you know, through, through clever, you know, you know, uh, paperwork, you want to be able to have the benefits of other corporations while still maintaining the proper, I guess, appearance of, the, of like, your LLC. For example, you know, like you said, you know, you get LLC and you want to divvy up maybe, like, the revenue as a partnership. So, like, how would you, maintain the proper requirements to be recognized as LLC while still taking up the advantages that you were given an example of? Well, you you do it with your agreements, right? If you have a shareholder, you know, we talk, we're talk we talking down here about what agreements do you need. We'll jump to that for a minute. If you have a limited liability company, you have an operating agreement. If you have a partnership, you have a partnership agreement. If you have a corporation, you have a shareholder's agreement. Okay, and at least with respect to limited liability companies and corporations, the state statutes have some provisions that say, for example, how do you liquidate one? Who gets what if you don't have an agreement? Okay, so there are there's some recourse to the state statutes. If but but you're much better advised to understand with with your advisors the difference between a corporation, a limited liability company, a partnership. Pick the entity that you want to have for the right kind of consequences you want to generate both financially and from a tax perspective and then follow the agreement. The problem would come, the, the problem you, you posed is somebody did all, did all the agreements and they formed the entity and then they ignored it and did something else. That happens all the time by the way. Um, and, and so the problem is somebody comes to me and so and so is not doing what they're supposed to and I find out nobody's done what they were supposed to for 10 years and now they want me to use this agreement to hit somebody over the head. Well, it may not work very well. Uh -huh. I'm going to ask a question that was raised um, by one of the class. I'm going to rephrase it just a little bit. But if someone is considering a partnership, mm -hmm. okay, what are three or four or maybe five of the basic fundamental things that they need to think about, you know, a, you know, you know what the major criteria, major topics that they need to think about in, in, in forming a partnership? Well, I, I think it goes back to what we've talked about. They need to think about liability. They need to think about tax 
consequences. They need to be, think about financial consequences of dividing the profits and losses of the business and they need to think about consequences on liquidation because each of these types of entities are different depending on which entity you choose and what your agreement says. Does that get, get at what you want? Okay, so you know, I mean, we could spend three class periods talking about the details of the different types of entities, but I think that question summarizes the, the most important thing you need to know is that each entity has its specific consequences. Those consequences can be manipulated with agreements between the owners, and it's important to, to take into account those factors that I just mentioned to be able to get the result that you want. Sometimes the marketplace will dictate what you do. For example, if, if we're going to take your business and we've got a five-year plan to build your business up to $2 million in gross revenues and sell it, we probably want a corporation. Okay? It may be that nobody will buy your corporation anyway because they don't want your liability. They'll buy your assets and push your corporation away, but they, they surely won't buy your limited liability company. So probably we would want to set your business up as a corporation if our goal is to prepare it to sell. Um, it's important to know that if, if you're going to start a small business that may grow into something bigger, it's pretty easy to go from limited liability company or partnership to corporation. The tax consequences of going from a corporation to a limited liability company or partnership or an individual's uh, uh, sole proprietorship are pretty drastic. So a corporation is treated as a separate person for income tax purposes and if you try to liquidate that corporation there's a lot of tax consequence and, and difficulty that comes with that. So a lot of complexity to think about. The, the key message on, on type of entity and formation is understand the differences Choose the, diff choose the structure that you want specific to your goals and objectives. So I had a meeting this morning with a person who wants to bring a partner into his business. And we talked for about an hour and, and I gave him some thoughts and ideas, but rather than drafting a bunch of documents and handing them to him, which I certainly can do and will ultimately do, instead I gave him an outline. I said, here are all the issues that your agreement has to cover with the person you want to bring in. Who buys what from whom? How much does it cost? What happens if somebody dies? What happens if somebody can't work? All, all of the issues. Go think about those and then come back next week and let's sit down and talk again so that I can draft a document that addresses your needs. So if you go to a form book in the library, you can find forms that cover all of those issues. And the trick is knowing which ones to pick and what you want to do and how to, how to combine it into something that works. Both as a guide while you're going along and, heaven forbid, you get into a problem in a fight, you can establish what it is you're going to do. Okay. More? Okay. Partners. And by partners, I, I'll, I mean co-owners. What do you think about partners? I had one once that said they were for dancing. So, so how would you bring partners into your business? This is the part where you talk. <laughs> yeah? so, so I have a friend who has a real job and is not a poor college student. And mm -hmm. he's thinking about the... Uh, but you're having more fun, right? E exactly. Yes. Well, hardly. <laughs> um, he's thinking about backing me in a business venture. And so we're, we're talking about what we'll need to do to become partners. And so, for us, we need to figure out, since he's the money and I'm boots, where the ownership lies. And I suppose we need to talk to a lawyer to get, you know, points. Like, what if I want out in six months? What if he wants out in a year, you know? Mm -hmm. How that will work. Yep. So, since you are talking to a lawyer, let's talk about that for a minute. Let, I mean, let's, let's use your example. What, what does he want to own? Well, so... Um, Why is he willing to give you money? Let's ask that. How it works is uh, I've got an eBay shop that, with my meager means, has been growing, right? And he's, he thinks that if he puts $2,000 of inventory into it, 
that I can give him a, a reasonable return. Okay. And so that's, I guess that's where we're at right now. Okay, what does a reasonable return mean to him? Uh, what a reasonable return means to him is he doesn't have to think about it, touch it, or do anything to it, and it brings him 5% into his bank account every month. For how long? As long as I'm willing to operate, I guess. Okay. What happens if you're not willing to operate? Can he take it over? Does it go away? I don't know. We haven't talked about that. Okay. Um, does he expect, since he's putting up the money, does he think money or the idea is more important? Um, I think, just from what we talked about this last week, I think we're pretty 50-50 because he has no idea how to run the shop and I have no means to get the money. And so I, what it sounds like to me is we're pretty 50-50 on it. He understands that the idea and the operation is worth it to him to give me an equal share. But at the same time... So it's your idea and he's going to give you an equal share? Yeah. Okay. Do you see anything wrong with that language? You worried about what you just said? Um, no, because I need the money. Okay. So you have to make a choice about what you're willing to give up to get the money. Yeah. How will you feel 10 years from now when you're no longer a poor college student, you're having less fun but making more money, and the store's doing well, and you're giving all the effort, the company's yielding a million dollars a year and he, get, he gave you five thousand dollars to start it. Do you still want to be 50-50? Yeah, because it's just as equal of a chance that he loses his five thousand dollars for the first year. I, I think it's, for him, it's a, it's a risk. It's a big risk. Because, I mean, he's making real money, but two thousand, five thousand dollars is not a small amount for, True. for what he's making. So, for, for anybody, it's not a small amount. Yeah, and, and I guess uh, I feel like it's worth it to me to give him half ownership because otherwise I'll have to wait. And I don't feel like waiting is the right thing for me to do with this idea. Okay. So what's the most important thing for you to do? Get it written out. No yeah. Right. Yeah, have, have an agreement that sets forth all the parameters. Because right now, it seems like both of you understand what you each bring to the table, and you both think it's worth the same thing. And you don't want that to change, right? You want to lock in what you're going to do for each other now. Or even if you think it should change over time, you're going to lock in how, how you're going to change your financial circumstances so that you never have to have an argument with your friend, right? Now, people can change their minds and take crazy positions, but often they don't. If everybody clearly understands up front, you're going to be working for the next 25 years, and he's putting up a little money now, and splitting 50-50 is okay. Right? So you're saying, like, in, into the operating agreement, we'll put in six months' time from now, I will have this, this share of the corporation, or the, the share of the entity. And in a year from now, we'll be at this point. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm suggesting that one, you would memorialize in the agreement your current feeling about your, the equality of your contributions. So that it's set out in words you won't get that in a book in the library, by the way. It, it's set out in words what you bring and what he brings. You would, you would each own, if 50-50 is a number, you might each own 50% now. But you would recite to each other in the agreement why that makes good sense. By the way, that's good tax planning, too. Because then you don't have to worry about explaining to the IRS why nobody gave anybody anything. Okay. Um, but, but you would want to memorialize the basis for your agreement, why you're willing to do what you're doing and why it makes sense long term. You don't have to do it in, in lots of language, but a little nod to that detail may save an argument later on because you can always go back and say, look, this is what we agreed to and this is what it said and it's clear and we're, we're not going to change it. Okay. Or we are going to change it and here's why. But it, it tends to avoid an argument. 
More thoughts? Okay. Can I pose a question? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And again, it, it, the, one of the students said they are looking at a, a, a possible business that they might want to eventually franchise. Mm -hmm. What is the thought that they need to think about in the early stages of creating a business if they want to, in the future to put, put it into a franchise? Franchising is about branding. Okay, how many of you are marketing folks? Come on, somebody, you're taking marketing. Okay. So, so marketing, and neither am I, but marketing is all about name brand, what does it look like, what does it feel like, how does going in, what's the experience of going into the store or buying the product or whatever it is. If you're going to franchise a business, that's a, a little different model. You're going to have you're going to have other people you're doing business with, but you're not going to be in their pocket and they're not going to be in yours. You're going to create a name, a look, a feel, and you're going to own that name and look and feel. And then you're going to comply with the state and federal laws regarding disclosure, uniform franchise circulars and those sorts of things. And then you're going to sell people the opportunity to have their business look and feel like your idea. So, your McDonald's, every McDonald's is going to look the same or approximately the same based on how you say it will look and you're going to have an agreement with me that says I can open your McDonald's store under my name, I'll put the McDonald's name on it, I'll decorate it the way you, you, know, you tell me I have to decorate it. I get to keep all the money from it except I have to pay you the fees that are listed in the franchise agreement. And those fees may be a percentage of the profits, and they may be a marketing consulting fee, and they may be a, a, a marketing information fee where I provide certain kinds of advertising. And so that relationship is about you and I don't put our businesses together and we don't rise and fall with one another. You make money because I get to use the intellectual property and the look and the feel that you created and I pay you for that right. But so if, if you want to be able to franchise your business, from the very earliest point you're going to want to think about what does it look like, what does it feel like. If there are logos or paint schemes or things that influence how it looks and feels, that may be something you need to protect with patents or copyrights. Okay? Because if I can look at your idea and go make one over here because it's not protected and you have no basis to stop me, then, then you've lost your, your rights. So if, if you're going to franchise, coming up with that, that proprietary information and proprietary look and feel and protecting it is going to be the most important thing up front for you because you aren't going to have necessarily partners. You're going to be selling that group of ideas and, and looks and feels to another person. Okay. Um, just briefly on details. So what do you know about how to form a company? If you want to make a corporation, how do you do it? Anybody know? Nobody knows? Homework. Homework. Get on the Arizona Corporation Commission website tonight. Okay? I want you to do a couple of things. One, I want you to get on. There's a, there's a place that says, if you tab into it, I didn't bring my iPad, but if you tab into it, it'll say business entity search. Go there and go, I think it's in that tab, and look under name availability. Okay? And then pick a business name. Just try one and type it in and see what you get. Okay? That's your first step. You find out if a name is available. There are two ways to reserve a name in Arizona. One is to spend five bucks and file a trade name application with the Arizona Secretary of State's office. Theoretically, that reserves the name unto you and you can use it however you want, whenever you want. You have to renew it every so often. However, the Arizona Corporation Commission doesn't communicate that well with the Arizona Secretary of State's office, so sometimes they'll let me make a company name even though there's a similar trade name at the Secretary of State's office. So if you really want to lock a name up in Arizona, file, form a company under the uh, Arizona Corporation Commission and then it's a lot less likely that somebody will be able to 
uh, take it. Now, if you want to take your business and it's going to be in Arizona for a little bit and then you want to go to Tennessee and Arkansas and Texas and, and Minnesota and go throughout the country, you might want to think about federal trademark or trade name registrations. Okay, so that you have multi-state protections. You also, by the way, might want to make registrations in each state where you intend to do business. So you can get into a lot of uh, intellectual property protection issues. But to form this company, the first thing is to find the name that is not like somebody else's name and can't be confused. Because if you form a company, even if you just form a sole proprietorship, and I guess we didn't talk about that, you don't have to form a company, you can just be you. and and make a business. There, there are some issues with that we'll talk about in a minute. But if you do that and you call it McDonald's and you start selling whatever you sell, I promise you that within about 60 days you'll get a really nasty letter from somebody like me who works for McDonald's saying, leave our name alone. And if you want to fight about it, you can spend 40 or 50 or $60,000 fighting and then you'll have to leave their name alone. Okay? So, so picking a name that isn't used by somebody else is important. Then you have to, if the Corporation Commission, um, if, if you're forming a limited liability or a corporation, you file a document with the Arizona Corporation Commission. For a corporation, you file articles of incorporation. Second bit of homework. Get out of the business entity name search and go look for forms and find a form for the er for articles of incorporation. Yeah. I've got a name. They want to get that name. They want to give me also for Yeah, so that means, and you can push on that link and it'll take you to the Secretary of State's office and it'll show you who owns it, that sort of thing. Um, so go online and look at articles of incorporation so you see the information they want to know about. If you're making a limited liability company, it's articles of organization. Again, tonight go online and look at that. And she's grading all that, right? <laughs> um, if you're forming a partnership, you'll register a general partnership or a limited partnership with the Secretary of State's office. Okay, So it's a different place to go. If you're forming a sole proprietorship and it's just going to be you, you don't have to file it at all. But remember, you're at risk. I mean, if, if you set up a company, if your name's Joe and you set up Joe's Barbecue, again, you're going to have a letter from Joe's out in Gilbert saying, hey, leave our name alone, even though it's your name too. So. If you don't file something, you're vulnerable to somebody using your name or bumping into somebody who already is using the name. If you file that and the document is acceptable, you got to remember, one thing to remember is the filing fee is, I think, $65. And nobody should do that for $65. Pay an extra $35 for an expedited fee, and you'll get it back in two or three days. If you don't, you'll get it back in two or three months. So here's the story. I'm brand new uh, at, at doing this kind of law, and I go down to the Corporation Commission. I hand carry one of these, and I pay my 65 bucks, and the lady puts it in a pile. And I said, when can I expect to see it? And we're in June, and she says, sometime in October. And I said, well, OK, so how can I get it a little faster? Oh, pay the expedited fee. How much is that? 35 bucks. So I write her a check, give her the check. She pulls my paper off the pile, stamps it approved, and hands it back to me. <laughs> So, <laughs> bureaucracy rules, right? Um, so you, you want to pay the expedited fee to get your company back quickly. And then, and then once it comes back, they will tell you you have to publish it, it publish the articles in a newspaper of public uh, circulation. So you can publish it anywhere. The cheapest place is the Arizona Capital Times, so most of us use that. But you can do it in the Tribune or the Arizona Republic or wherever you want to. Okay, in the, I think it's in the county that you, you do the business in. Once you do that, you have an entity formed. The next thing you would need to do is you would need to submit a form SS-4 
to the Internal Revenue Service to apply for a tax identification number. That form is going to require you to tell them when you expect to pay payroll and how many employees you will have. The reason they care about that is they want to charge you employment taxes and they have all sorts of nasty penalties that apply to the business and to you if you don't pay them. So this is how they start to get their clutches on you, right? So you'll want to file your form SS4. If you're going to elect to have your corporation or your limited liability be an S corporation, you have two and a half months from the beginning of the first tax year to do it, or the beginning of the tax year. If it's a brand new entity, it starts from the day you form it, two and a half months later. If it's, if it's uh, the beginning of, of a calendar year, then you've got till March 15th, which is two and a half months. You can file it ahead of time if you file one in December, you can say it's effective January 1st and, and then you're within the first two and a half months. But with an S election, you have to be careful to check out the, the time period and make sure you file your election within that time period. One other little detail on that that I, I like to tell people is if you're married and you're making a company and you want to file an S election, please do not forget to have your spouse sign the S election. Why, you might ask. My spouse doesn't own my stock. It's all in my name. True, but you're in Arizona. We're a community property state. Therefore, your spouse is deemed to own half of everything you own, which is true whether or not we were in a community property state, right? She'd still think that. Um, your spouse, by law, owns half of everything you own, and therefore the S election will not be valid unless your spouse and you sign the S election form. So a, a small detail to care about. Question, thought? It's way better if you talk than if I talk. Any any questions about formation? Yeah. I, I can't hear you, you gotta talk loud. I'm sorry, you were bring up the points about the proprietary field. Yeah. And you were talking about how it's very important to conform with kind of like what would be like the starting point? Is it like a website or is there like a particular forms you need to fill out, you know, like trademarking? Well, if you'll go to the Secretary of State's website, you can look at the state forms for filing a trade name or trademark app or trade name application uh, there. Federal trademark stuff is more complex. You probably need somebody to help you with that. There are uh, there are paralegals around who can do it. If it's much more complex than just a just a logo or something, I'd probably get a lawyer involved. Those folks are pretty specialized in what they do. Um, the, the trick with some of the federal intellectual property filings is you have to research on special databases who has ideas that are like yours. So particularly when you're, when you're going from just basic naming issues or logo issues onto product issues, but even in some of the naming issues, you have to do research to make sure you're not bumping into somebody else who has a similar idea. The standard will be, is it confusing to the public? Okay, so if what you're doing, if I want to call my company McDonald's with a little m, the question that the, the feds will ask is, is my name and my look going to be confusing to the public? And will it make them think when they're in my shop, they, they're really going to the other store? Okay, it will help that I don't sell hamburgers. But Okay. okay. Because they want to know, can you give us a really basic explanation of the difference between a copyright, a trademark, and intellectual property? Well, this is not my area of expertise, but I deal with it enough. I can give you some basic understanding. A copyright is a both a common law, meaning because you did it and it's your work, you have some common law rights without a filing, and a federally statutory protected, if you file, right, that allows you to protect something that you write or create. Okay, so documents, think documents. A copyright protects documents, protects, I guess it would protect paintings. So it would protect the artwork, that sort of thing. Something that you create in general is subject of a federal copyright filing. And the idea would be the government is going to give you a monopoly on using that for a limited period of time. And in exchange for that, you, you have to pay a fee and file for it. 
therefore it's out of the public or out of the public's hands for a while and you have the opportunity to make whatever money you can make with it and you own it so think about music I if I write a, a piece of music and I don't copyright it and somebody uses it then I get nothing for it um, this this used to happen in the 50s a lot when music was kind of kind of budding in the United States and rock and roll was coming into being and there were a lot of people playing and they were writing things and some of it was pretty good and promoters would go snatch it up for a few dollars because all these poor starving musicians were creating this this music and then they were still performing it but somebody own, else owned the right to it so remember Michael Jackson's book and he owned all the Beatles songs that was the sort of thing somebody had sold that portfolio somewhere along the line and so here's somebody who didn't even create it who owned the rights to it and every time that record got played somebody sent a royalty to to Michael that's why it was worth so much money. Trade or a trademark is a registration that allows you to protect a name and the look of a name. So McDonald's with the, the, the golden arches, perfect example of a trademark. And that's, I'm sure, a subject of a federal trademark registration. Again, it gives you nationwide protection. Now, where doesn't, where doesn't that step help you? Outside of the US. Yeah, China. So here, here's, here's one. A friend of mine's for a girlfriend uh, does marketing for a large company and she was heading off to, to Beijing for a conference and he asked her, are you taking your cell phone? Well, yes, I'm taking my cell phone. No, no, no. You should get a different cell phone because if I have the right kind of device, I can walk right by, by you and I can suck all the information off of your phone onto my device and now I know all your information. And if you happen to be carrying proprietary information, designs, drawings, whatever, now I've got them all. And you know, one of the issues we've been talking about with that person is all the, the efforts from foreign countries to try to steal intellectual property from the United States and other countries that generate more of it. So, um, Patent is another way to protect intellectual property, that's typically protecting devices and ideas for devices and inventions and that sort of thing, but it's the similar principles apply. So, mm -hmm. would that also be able to protect the layout of a store? Say like McDonald's, they have their mind that they work on, would you be able to patent something like that? I don't know that. I, I don't know enough. I, I, again, I don't practice in that area. I don't, there would be a federal filing that likely would protect that, whether that's a trademark or whether it's a, a, a patent I, I'm not, or a copyright. One of those will protect it. I just don't know which one. So, okay. Um, let's talk. We're kind of, we're kind of moving operations in. Let, let's just talk for a minute about that because it, it's important as you think about forming your business to what's going to happen over time. So here's the classic problem. You get in business with your partner and go along and then one day you decide, you know, I'm just tired of doing this. There's enough money coming in. I'm going to go sit by the pool two days a week. And by the way, I'm moving to Tucson because it's a quieter place. And you know, I've got three teenagers who can run the store. What's your partner do? What if, what if you didn't do all the things we've talked about and you had no agreement, then what? But you formed a corporation. How does he pull his money out? He's not entitled by statute to do that. So now, now you've got a problem where everybody assumed a certain set of facts. We're going to operate this way. You're going to do this. I'm going to do this. You're going to work this much. I'm going to work that much. And none of it's set out. So one thing I would consider when I'm forming a company, if I'm going to have another person involved, I might consider employment agreements. Okay. Why would I do that? I think what, what, what would be in a good employment agreement? Anybody ideas? What would you want if you were if you were going to hire me? What would you want in an employment agreement? Start with the easy one. Would you want to tell me how much money I'm making? Thank you. Good. 
Okay, so we can get that one out of the way. What else? What else would you want? What do you think? Yeah, yeah. How much I'm going to work? What's the basis of my job? What else? Say it again. Yeah, yeah. What am I going to do? I'm not coming to just play video games. Well, maybe in your business, I'm coming to play video games. Awesome. But I had a client one time come, and he made a couple hundred thousand dollars a year doing two things. One, he used some computer algorithm he had created to make gaming codes that people use to get into games. The other was he hired teenagers to play Second Life to earn money in Second Life, which he then sold to people outside for real money so that they could use it to play the game. Made no sense to me, but he made a lot of money doing it. <laughs> yeah, I, I have no idea why I'm practicing law for a living, right? <laughs> Except that I don't know that much about that kind of computer. What, what else would you want in an employment agreement? This is the part where you talk again. Benefits. Yeah, might want benefits. Interesting point on that. What can you promise? As the employer? Mm -hmm. Are you going to promise? Are you going to promise to pay for surgeries? If you're a really nice guy. <laughs> here, here, here's the point I'm trying to make. I'm not doing it very well. You don't want to promise something you can't deliver. Okay. So my my employment agreements would typically say something like, the employee shall be entitled to participate in the benefit plans sponsored from time to time by the employer in accordance with the terms and conditions of those plans. Now what I've done is I've said you can have benefits if I give them to you, when I give them to you, depending on what I give to you, and the plan will tell you what you get so that I never promise something that the insurance company won't give because most of the benefits are insured. What about protecting your property? What about, what about protecting your property? What, what do you want in there about that? What kind of property might you have in your business? Could. Sign agreement staying the same. Okay, got to be a little careful with some of that because of the National Labor Relations Board. You can't stop employees from talking about things that would help their employment situation. For example, don't tell them not to talk to each other about how much they're paid because that'll, that's the quickest way to lose 10,000 bucks I've ever seen. But they do it all the time. But if the National Labor Relations Board comes in, gets a complaint, it's a $10,000 bill to fix it and it takes about two weeks. The money. Yeah, yeah, they make a complaint and then NLRB forces you to pay them money to resolve it. But, but, um, but, but you're right, you'd want to protect your intellectual property. My son is an engineer at Boeing. If he invents something, it belongs to them unless they say we don't want it. I mean, if he made a, you know, they make helicopters and if he invented, you know, a new box to put coins in, he'd have to go to them and say, can I have this? And they'd say yes or no. Sometimes they say yes, sometimes they say no. They said no one time, or they say yes one time, and then somebody went off and made a whole bunch of money with this, whatever it was. What else might it have? What, what, el what else is your property? What, what's one of the most important things to any small business? What about the people who pay you money? Customers, yeah, yeah. So one of the most important things you might want to protect is your customer list. Because I'm going to hire you to sell stuff for me, right? And I'm going to tell you who to go see. You're going to go find some people too, but I'm going to tell you who to start with. And I don't want you going and get, becoming friendly with them and then leaving me, right? Okay, so what other, any other questions about, about that? Since you're on the vein of, of employment, Mm -hmm. okay. you know, yeah, it's, it's one of the big issues that's been going around in Arizona has to do with how do you ensure you've got legal employees 
Okay, can you, can you address that a little bit? Because I trust that, that some of these people are going to all be businesses and they're going to probably end up with a few employees. You, you know, that, that that's just an interesting tug of war. Our immigration system is just completely screwed up, right? We've, we've had guest worker programs and we've let them expire and we've created expectations for people coming across our borders and then we've pulled back on the expectations. The real solution is it's got to be fixed. The practical circumstance right now is you have a state law, much of which has been invalidated, but some of which is still around. You have ICE running around visiting businesses and what ICE will do is when you when you hire somebody everybody has to fill out a form called an I-9 form which means you got to give them one or two uh, for, uh, copies of documents proving that you have the legal right to work in the United States and then you're obligated as an employer to keep those forms on file and ICE will come in, the Immigration and Naturalization Service will come in and actually ask to review your forms and they'll take them off to their office and they'll check people out. Um, there will be a different consequence if you're intentionally hiring people who you know aren't legal than if you aren't. And, and the, you know, the trouble is people figured out how to make documents, right? So the conundrum for employers is do I keep copies of all the documents they give me and then I can show the investigator that I was diligent and I looked at the documents because that's my only legal obligation. But if I do that, then I expose myself to the claim by the investigator that oh, you should have known that was a fake driver's license. How would I know? I, I embalm bodies for a living. I don't know how to check out driver's licenses, right? But so some people keep copies and some don't. Um, it's important to be able to demonstrate that you reviewed those. So an I-9 has you sign your name saying, the, the employee signs it saying, I verify this is true and I've showed you this document and that document and the employer signs the name saying, I've, uh, you know, I've looked at this, I've inspected these documents, that was my legal obligation. Most people would keep copies, not everybody does. But, uh, you know, that's one thing. You know, the other thing is you can't just turn around and fire somebody. So, I had a client one time who found out a lady was illegal and using her sister's name because they'll, you know, people who are trying to stay under the radar will use different names. They'll use forged documents. They'll do whatever, whatever they are doing. And you can't just fire them. I mean, if you've got somebody, for example, who's come up from Mexico, uh, that could be race discrimination, right, or national origin discrimination. You can get a lawsuit over that. So what you do is you say, look, your documents don't match up. We've run, when somebody first is hired, you can run them through a federal database called E-Verify and you can find out if E-Verify, the federal system, thinks they're legal. That is not foolproof, by the way. The, data, the database is not perfect. But I would certainly keep documentation to prove that I had done that. And then if, despite all those efforts, you find out you've got a problem, you tell the person, look, take 30 days and figure this out. This says your social security number doesn't match. I don't know why. Go figure it out. And you give them time to figure it out. If ultimately they can't get it resolved, then you can terminate them. But you have to give them the opportunity, or at least you're prudent to give them the opportunity if you, know, if you do that. So it's, it's sort of, a, sort of an, a really unresolved problem. Here's the other scary thing about immigration. Last year, 95,000 people came across our southern border illegally who were not from Mexico. Many of whom may have been from countries that sponsor terrorism and you know who knows who they are, right? So it's just a big broken problem that, that we got to worry about. You're about ready for me to be done. Yeah, this, this is the time. Let me, let me jump. We've talked a little bit about the agreement, so I don't know that we need to spend a lot more time on that. Let's talk about regulations for a minute. So if you have a small business, several things, you know, there's the Internal Revenue Service who we know and love, right? They're, they're going to care about income taxes. They're going to care about payroll taxes. They're going to care about excise taxes. What else are they going to care about? They're going to care about taxes having to do with employee benefit plans. Um, highly regulated area. So you asked, when do you need a good lawyer? In the beginning, it makes sense to establish a relationship with some trusted advisors. 
good CPA, good lawyer, uh, maybe a good business advisor, although you know some of those outside of CPAs and lawyers, you know, some of them are just sales guys, so you've got to be careful. But it's important to have people you can call on when something arises. You may not use them very much. You'll probably use your CPA more than your lawyer, but pretty important to have somebody you can ask questions of. Um, particularly tax questions. Income taxes are pretty easy. You're earning re income and you're reporting income and expenses on your tax return, but if you start transferring ownership, if you start changing entities, if you start liquidating or merging, those, those things get fairly complex and, and are difficult. You have, uh, in addition, you have the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is going to regulate the, uh, the Title VII discrimination laws. Uh, those, those are really important. Can't discriminate on the basis of sex, national origin, um, race, color, you know, the typically protected classes, yeah? When was that, that basic law initially passed? Holy cow, 19... I won't get it right. Uh, more than 40 years ago. Okay, more than 40 years ago. Yeah. Do you have any idea of either the size or the number of claims that are still being filed on that, on that law? They're, they're creating problems for businesses? I have a partner who does only that. And there are many people who do only that in the country. It's a huge area. I mean, all right, another story. So I'm in law school, right? This is like 300 million years ago. Um, and I remember the American Bar Journal came out with a magazine and the, the story reported was of a law firm, of all things, who had a, a, a bunch of summer associate people from law school come work for them to see if they wanted to be lawyers there. And one of their activities was a wet t-shirt contest with the lady people who came for their program. You know, holy cow, you know. Today, if, if you did that, You'd, you'd be in a huge lawsuit. So th that continues to be a huge area of litigation. And, and the, the dumb thing about that, and, and this, is, this is really important for your businesses, the dumb thing about that is for the most part it's legislating courtesy, right? I, I mean, most of it is common sense and people don't stop and think about what they say and what, who they say it to. And you know, Sometimes if you just don't say it, you're better off. Uh, the National Labor Relations Board I mentioned, that is mostly the National Labor Relations Board deals with unions, but not, not all. So there is a portion of the National Labor Relations Act that allows employees to engage in concerted activity, meaning whatever they think that is that improves their situation. Often what, they, what that's interpreted as as picketing or demonstrating. Right? But it also means don't be too limiting on what your employees say to one another. This should make you pause to think whether you really want employees, right? And some, some people choose not to. Now, I will tell you uh, th that in, in these statutes, it doesn't always help to say, fine, here's a company over here and it's got all the employees and I am a company by myself and I have no employees but I will hire that company to provide employees. They thought of that, and so you can combine companies. You can combine them for discrimination purposes, workers' comp purposes, tax purposes, employee benefits purposes. There are a whole bunch of rules about how you bring companies together. Um, one of the newest areas of regulation that's causing people a lot of consternation is the Affordable Care Act. How many of you heard much about that? So, so <laughs> difficulty with the Affordable Care Act is everybody who has 50 or more employees has to provide health insurance. And they, it's a three-part stool, right? Tax on the employer if they don't, tax on the insurance companies on premium revenue, and tax on individuals if they don't have health insurance. So, and there's all sorts of complexities that are causing trouble there. Uh, there's also safety regulators out there. So you may have your operation going on and one day there's a knock at the door and it's somebody from the Arizona Department of Health and Safety and they want to inspect to make sure that you've complied with the rules from a set of books that big and uh, you know, are all the yellow lines on the floor and guards on the machines or whatever the safety issues are for the chemicals in your business. And that can cause you, we just settled a case 
last week. Um, we finally got the $70,000 fine down to $30,000, but not without significant pain and suffering on the business's part. So uh, detailed safety regulations are, are a big issue. What else am I missing? Department of Labor. Department of Labor is fun because they, they like to make sure that for every hour in which your employee who is not exempt works in excess of 40 per week, they get paid time and a half for, for their rate of pay. And if you don't do it, they like to come in and penalize you and it can be double damages or under state law even treble the amount of the wages. Yes, ma'am. Okay. What they would do is, if you had by Wednesday and they could tell that you were going to have overtime, they may kill that overtime by taking a longer lunch. Is that permitted? Or do you think that would go wrong? No, that's permitted. Yeah. You, you, the way I advise clients to avoid having an overtime problem is tell them to prohibit it, overtly prohibit overtime, and if you work overtime without permission, you're fired. Well, that's the thing. Like, they'll ask you to stay. So the, the issue then would become, are you at, on a lunch break at the store for their convenience or your convenience? If they put you in a situation where you can't control your time, arguably you might be there for their convenience and it may be that the lunch hour actually could be chargeable as, as time on the clock. So each, each case is, is different. Uh, and as you can imagine, employers try to manipulate that stuff frequently. Another little interesting trick, are you about ready for me to be done? So another interesting trick the Department of Labor will do is they'll show up at your job site and that, you know, we had one about a year ago where people would come to the job site for a ride because the, they actually come to the office for a ride to the job site because they didn't have cars and they, or they only had one family car and, and uh, they couldn't afford to buy two. And so they come for a ride and the Department of Labor came in and concluded that the moment they walked in, even though they were just waiting for a ride, they're on the clock. That, by the way, has implications for the Affordable Care Act because it increases the number of employees you have potentially and makes you subject to it. So all, all of these regulations, and I'm kind of skipping across the pond, but all of the regulations kind of intertwine with another, one another. And the facts that you develop in one, if you're working on a tax issue, can have serious impact on a Department of Labor issue. And you know, you're creating public records and public documents and, and evidence. So. Uh,